everybody. Um, the next talk is called Understanding Non-Blocking I.O. by Vaidik. Uh, Vaidik is a software engineer working for Wingify, a startup based out of New Delhi that develops A-B testing tool called website, uh, Visual Website Optimizer. He's focusing primarily on services, scalability, and infrastructure engineering, which also happens to involve working with data and analytics, and he is an, of course, open source enthusiast. So let's have a great applause for Vaidik. Thanks, Martin. Hi, guys. Good afternoon. Uh, so uh, firstly, thanks for having me here. Uh, this is for the first time I'm here in Singapore. And it's primarily because of PyCon Singapore. So thanks for making that happen. Um, today I'm going to be talking about understanding non-blocking IO. Actually, um, can everybody hear me without the mic? Is that good? So I'll just keep the mic aside. Yeah. Uh, and I'm doing that because I have a couple of uh, you know demos, rather like code samples to run. So I don't want to be holding and be slow at the laptop. Uh, so uh, just uh, a high-level overview: what we are going to be talking about is non-blocking I/O. Uh, this is going to be like understanding like the very basics of how non-blocking I/O works, and uh, we'll do that by looking at some examples that I have uh, with me. Uh, uh, finally, we'll have a little word about why should you why should you really care about understanding what is going on behind uh, uh, you know all those libraries like gevent or frameworks like uh, tornado uh, or networking engines like twisted why do you need to really understand these things and when can it matter and uh, what should you do then uh, but yes be be warned that this is not really an in depth about tornado twisted or even gevent or anything of that sort we're going to look at the like very basic infrastructure that is provided by Python uh, and the operating system uh, for implementing non-blocking I/O, and pr mostly focusing on Python, less on the uh, uh, operating system. But uh, wherever needed, I'll you know, leave a little hint so that you know, when you go back home, you can actually delve deeper and see what is going on behind uh, these things. But who am I? I am. Uh, I've been working with Python for almost like four years now. Uh, uh, I'm an infrastructure engineer at Wingify, uh, so responsible for all things systems and operations, DevOps. Uh, uh, the company is based out of New Delhi, India. I work in New Delhi. Uh, and yeah, just in case if you need to follow me on these social networks. Uh, so yeah, some background, like how did I like really come to even understand that something like this is important for anybody to understand. So just, just like probably any other college student or college student in India, I started out with Python. Uh, I took up you know, learning web development, uh, started out with Django. Uh, did my first serious project uh, where you know, I had to build an API, which was becoming slow, and I, I tried to delve deeper. Like, how can I make this system fast for you know whatever uh, traffic I was getting? And uh, after like reading through things, attending some meetups, uh, heard about this thing called G event, and uh, yeah, that was that was probably the first time when I tried my hands on with something uh, that made I/O non-blocking. But I always wondered what it was, so I used it, yes, but without really understanding what was happening. So it seemed like sort of black magic to me. So uh, very soon, like after after a while, when I did more of such stuff, I decided to actually delve deeper, which which uh, made me interested in the subject. So let's get started. Like, so what is non-blocking I/O? Uh, and just before we define that, let's just actually take a step back and look at what is blocking. So uh, any code block or a function that does something and takes time is basically blocking. Uh, so it could be you know, uh, a for loop doing some, uh, maybe even incrementing a counter, or maybe doing some statistics or mathematics, or maybe making a call to a database, making a, an HTTP request to an external service or an API, uh, or requesting uh, the user to uh, input something on the console. Uh, Everything which blocks the execution of something else later is, is basically blocking. Uh, so the problem with the blocking function is basically that if you have a program, a script, uh, or whatever, uh, and you have multiple independent tasks there, 
a blocking function or a blocking code block can actually block execution of something that is absolutely independent and has nothing to do with it. For example, uh, take a case of a web server where you have two endpoints, endpoint one and endpoint two. Endpoint one just like immediately returns, I don't know what, uh, hello world, but endpoint two basically makes uh, an HTTP request to another service. Whatever it gets from there processes that and then spits out whatever needs to be uh, sent in the response. Uh, and while uh, both the things are absolutely independent, you can write an HTTP server in a way that uh, the second endpoint actually blocks the first endpoint, whereas in between you're not really doing anything when you're making a call to this other service. So the, the idea behind actually um, working with non-blocking IA is that while uh, while you're doing something, uh, uh, while you're making while, while you're doing IO, uh, you're not really making use of your CPU, and you can actually process or do other independent tasks along with that. Uh, so you want to be able to be in a situation where you, your entire system, the overall system, proceeds, if not one task proceeds, uh, you know, alone. Uh, and that's the entire thing. So you may so. For just for example, I'll just like throw up a couple of random examples, sort of like useless examples. This is like first function, which is basically rather badly indented. Sorry about that. The third line actually uh, is a little less indented. But uh, yeah, that's just an infinite loop, which is which is blocking. Nothing to do with I/O, but it's just a it's blocking because it's con consuming CPU. Uh, Second function, the second example on the right is basically a sleep, which is also blocking. Um, third, in the third example, you see that you're, you're asking the user to you know, input something. And uh, as long as the user does not really input anything, it is still blocking. So if you have other tasks in the same program, which you know, calls this function, and after that probably does something else, uh, another independent task, that task will not really proceed, will not happen, uh, unless these functions return. On the more you know practical side, making a call to a, a making a, a running a, a query on MySQL can also be blocking. Depending upon, I mean, it is blocking. Uh, it, it just how how for how long does it block? It depends on the query. Uh, similarly, you know, making an HTTP request uh, would be blocking. So uh, as long as uh, blocking code is concerned when, well, there can be probably two reasons, CPU or I.O. that blocks your code or your entire program. Uh, you can't do much about CPU because, well, you got to do what you got to do. But when you do I.O., what really happens is that you're, you're not really making use of uh, any CPU. Your process actually goes to sleep. Uh, and uh, that's, some, that's the time when actually you can... Uh, write your program differently, or your script differently, or your web server differently, so that uh, other tasks which are independent of that particular task can actually proceed and move further. So, in, in, in like modern web applications, I/O is usually like the, the kind of things that we usually do. Although this is not exhaustive by any means, uh, could be dealing with the network, making HTTP requests or TCP requests as well. Uh, uh, reading or writing to write, reading from or writing to a file on disk, uh, pipe operations, communication IPC via pipe that is also blocking. But basically, what it comes down to is any kind of operation that is done on a file descriptor, uh, where you are sending data or trying to receive data. Uh, so, coming back to what is non-blocking I/O, basically trying to write your programs which are blocking execution of the entire system and progress of the entire system in a way that when some part or some portion of your program is blocking uh, because of IO, the other part can independently proceed further. Uh, and the overall execution does not get delayed. So non-blocking, uh, so yeah, uh, uh, when I uh, was talking about IO uh, in general, like what uh, IO means, uh, what I basically wanted to tell in that point of time was that here for today's presentation, we are going to be looking at network IO and how we can make that non-blocking in Python. Uh, so yeah, let's get started. So at the very basic level, what really happens is, uh, uh, this is, if you have, if you have any experience of use, with using uh, you know, the socket 
module in Python and doing any kind of networking uh, with Python. Uh, you create socket, you know, uh, make a kind of either you write a server using uh, that socket, you listen on a particular you know host or a host and port, or maybe you open a Unix socket. It depends on whatever kind of net networking you're doing, and uh, basically accept connections if that's a server, if it's a client. Then you connect to another server on a particular host and port. Uh, but w the, whenever you do that, basically uh, when you're trying to send data or receive data, it usually blocks. In fact, it, it does block all the time. Uh, what comes down to making a socket uh, non-blocking in Python is basically this. Uh, the socket object has a method called set blocking which basically, by default, every socket is blocking. And you can make it not block. Uh, but what does that exactly mean? Uh, I mean, that's not the end of it. If it was that simple, then probably all of us would have been doing that, and we wouldn't be here. But uh, what does that mean? Let's quickly look at that. So I'm, now I'm going to start with some examples. And the, the idea is that we'll have one small server script and one small client script. The client script will be trying to send about 70 MB of data to the server. The server will just echo that out and nothing else. This is, a, this is all TCP. So, so the idea is we'll start with blocking and we'll move to uh, you know step by step implement a non-blocking client. OK, so is that visible, or should I make that larger? Larger? Wait, 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 I'll just first. Is that visible? Or should I make that larger? Bigger? Better? Or, wait. Good enough now? Right. So, uh, I'll have to. Oh, yeah, that's great. Thanks a lot. <laughs> okay, so yeah, this is like our, uh, the our blocking basic blocking uh, TCP server uh, does nothing really. Just listens uh, uh, listens on localhost and port one two three four by default, and uh, waits for incoming connections here. Uh, as soon as it gets a connection, it tries to receive data from it, keeps on receiving data, and just prints it out. That's it. Uh, yeah. And on the other hand, we have a very simple client which does nothing. It just tries to connect to that server uh, on port 1234 and sends foobar, uh, yeah, like this longer string, uh, and just sends that, right? So let's try to run both these things. Here I have my server running. And simple as it looks, uh, it, the client is sending data, and the server is receiving it and printing it out. Uh, as you can see, the client is blocking right now, and it will block as long as all the data is not transmitted. Uh, and that's fine, because as long as this is what we, our client is trying to do, uh, we are okay with it blocking, uh, and uh, well, there's nothing as the client is trying to do anyways. Uh, this will take some time, so I'll just move forward and uh, look at the other example because it will take some time into printing this all this all this string out. So, uh, so yeah. So the problem with this is both the client and server are blocking. Uh, the client block blocks until all the data is sent, and the server blocks until all it has not received all the it has not received the connection, and then blocks until it has received all the data from the client. Uh, once that is done, then it goes on and listens to more, uh, listens for more, waits for more connections. Uh, let's look at the second example. Uh, the second example is uh, now we are going to just evolve our client and try to you know to fix that problem of blocking with it. So the client here, if the previous example and this one, there's not really much difference except the set blocking method that we talked about earlier. 
Uh, and what it does is basically calls that met method and uh, passes zero to it, which basically uh, makes the socket non-blocking. And when we, sorry? Uh, okay, yeah, sure. Wait. Is that better? Yeah. yeah. So, uh, yeah, let's just quickly run this. So, this program uh, completed its execution immediately, but uh, we see a, a client exited with an assertion error. Uh, why? So here on the last line, we send that the, all the data, but then we also put an assertion on it just to check if all the data was actually sent or not. Uh, what SOC.send really does is it returns uh, the number of bytes that were sent in that particular call. And when we do set blocking, uh, uh, set blocking is equal to zero, that is basically uh, make our socket non-blocking. Uh, our send call returns immediately, returning exactly the number of bytes that were transferred. Uh, but that is not really equal to the amount of data that we wanted to send. And what did really happen there? So when you call soc.send, uh, and uh, when the socket is non-blocking, uh, we don't want our socket to block. When you call soc.send, the data that you're sending, uh, only that part of data, only that amount of data will be sent as much as the network buffer for that socket can accommodate. So if the network buffer cannot accommodate more than, let's say, x amount of data, uh, x amount of bytes, uh, it will not send rest of the data. In fact, it will return only the uh, number of bytes that were sent. Uh, and that's uh, other, otherwise, when we don't make our socket non-blocking, or when our socket is blocking, uh, the soc.send call basically keeps waiting for the network buffer to you know, go empty, and then sends more data. Again, more another chunk of the data is actually transferred, uh, passed on to the kernel to send further. Uh, and that cycle goes on, and it blocks for that reason. Uh, and that is something, basically, that we want to prevent. We don't want our process to sleep, because the kernel puts it to sleep when the network uh, buffer goes full, and it cannot get more uh, bytes from the, uh, from the main process. So here, when we call soc.send with our socket uh, not blocking, non-blocking, only the amount of bytes that can be accommodated in the network buffer get actually passed on to the kernel to send it to the destination, and uh, it returns immediately. Uh, so with this example, uh, what we were able to achieve was that this does not block, but then it does not send all the data. Uh, and uh, and yes, uh, as I earlier mentioned, that soc.send actually sends the, just the amount of data the right buffer or the network buffer for that socket can accommodate. Uh, so the next thing is that we have some important information available to us. We wanted to send x amount of data, but only y was uh, we were able to send only y amount of data. So we can you know later on try to send more data uh, again and again. So let's quickly look at that. Yeah, so this is like slightly more uh, complicated as compared to our previous example. Pretty much the same as long as we are here. But now what do we do? Here, uh, so we send the amount of, uh, we try to send the same data as we were uh, trying to send earlier. Uh, but soc.send returns only the amount of bytes, the number of bytes that were actually transferred. So we maintain a record of how many bytes were transferred or what part of our string is remaining to be sent. Uh, so later on, when we move down, we just you know, discard rest of the, the, the string that was sent. And in a, in, an, in, in a while loop, we keep on sending remaining data. So if you'll see, yeah. So basically, uh, here we discard the, on this line, we discard the string that was sent. And then when this goes complete, this iteration goes complete, next time we try the same thing again. So when we try the same thing again, let's run this example. And so here we are sending the data, but also we are printing at the same time when, uh, uh, we are, when our call is getting blocked. 
and let's look at the example once again. Uh, so when we send this data, uh, when we call the sock dot send for the first time, the amount of bytes that can be transferred are just transferred. But when we immediately call it the next time, probably the network buffer is still full. And when the network buffer is still full, uh, when we call sock dot send in that situation, uh, basically a socket error is raised. That the socket uh, basically you cannot uh, send more data, or the resource is sort of like temporarily unavailable uh, to transfer uh, more data. So in uh, e again error is raised. Uh, we catch that and we simply just print out that as of now this is blocking, uh, so we cannot send more data. And on the next line, we have a select call, which is particularly interesting. Actually, if we uh, comment this out as well, our program will continue to run just that there will be slightly different output. We see a lot more blocking messages here on the uh, console. Uh, why is that? So. When we don't have this, basically the every time a sock dot send is non-blocking, every time you know it returns immediately and another iteration starts, and most of the time you know network buffer is full, so uh, we end up printing blocking with uh, the the line with you know, that says that right now it's blocking uh, a lot many times than in the previous example. But in the uh, the line that we commented, the select line. This is particularly interesting for implementing, uh, implementing you know, uh, real-world programs which make uh, sockets non-blocking, uh, which make I/O non-blocking. So select uh, is basically a system call that is uh, available on Linux and, in fact, on Unix as well, probably on Windows as well, if I'm not wrong. Uh, and what does it do exactly? Is uh, let's quickly look at that. So, uh, so yeah, this is a third example where uh, it does not block, but it sends all the data eventually because it keeps on trying in a while loop. Uh, but yeah, the bad thing is that we are still not doing anything. That's because we are not trying to do anything. But let's look at select once. Uh, yeah, we'll look at the fourth example later. So select is basically a system call for monitoring events on file descriptors. Uh, if you remember earlier, I mentioned that you know I/O is basically anything, any operation. Uh, on, on a file descriptor, really. Uh, so what we are interested in, in is that if we have a set of sockets or a set of uh, file descriptors, we want to know when they are actually available to perform any operation on. In our case, in our client's case, what we want to do is send more data. So we want to know when the socket is available to, be, uh, to send more data. Uh, otherwise, what we did was we were actually you know, continuously running that while loop, which was again wasting CPU cycles and not doing anything constructively. Select allows us to monitor those file descriptors. So uh, select is basically a, sys a system call uh, that is available in Linux. And uh, select, dot select module basically has a select function that wraps that system call and rather makes it very easy for us to use it otherwise as compared to the you know the uh, C counterpart of it, so uh, yeah. And if you do understand how you know how to use select in Python, understanding in C would become much easier. But if you come if you go to the C implement uh, C API directly, it would probably be take you a while to get your head around that because the API is actually pretty bad. So uh, getting back to our example, uh, what we're doing here is basically telling select. Select takes three arguments, uh, four actually, but we are not using the fourth one here, uh, where we tell what are the file descriptors or what are those objects with file number method. So any object with a file number method probably is, you know, uh, file number method on an object usually in Python world returns the file descriptor uh, of that object. So socket objects, for example, have file number method. So select basically accepts, uh, expects you to pass it three arrays, uh, which are basically arrays of objects that have file number method on them. Uh, what we want to do is we are interested in understanding when sock object here is available for writing more data. Uh, so the first argument basically ex expects an, you know, an array of uh, <laughs> objects with file number method on them, which you want to monitor for uh, 
uh, writing events to, uh, sorry, reading from. Uh, the second array is an uh, array of objects with file number method on, which from which you expect to uh, 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 to which you expect to write data to. And the third is basically which you want to monitor for exceptions. So we don't want to monitor at least anything as of now for exceptions or for reading. What we want to do is just send data. So we pass select uh, two empty arrays for first and third argument, and the second argument is basically the socket that we want to monitor for uh, writing. So what this does is select basically blocks until any of these uh, you know objects become uh, available for whatever events you are monitoring them for. So when we uncomment this, we see a lot less you know those blocking messages, and in fact execution is also sort of slow because whenever it blocks. Then on the next very next line, select blocks, and it blocks indefinitely until uh, until you can basic any any of those events actually occur on all the socket objects that you have passed them. So yeah, so this is basically select takes three sets of file descriptors or socket objects with file number method on them, uh, and returns exactly in the same order three sets or three lists of uh, objects. With file number methods on them, these objects are those which are ready for either reading, writing, or for handling exceptions. So, uh, so this basically helps us understanding. Uh, this basically helps us in uh, preventing uh, the, all the CPU cycles that we were wasting earlier with the select line commented. So, uh, and then there's this fourth argument here, which is a timeout. So, if you don't pass this, select would blo block indefinitely, but you can also set a timeout on that. Um, yeah. So now let's look at a more, you know, a, a rather useful example, because all this while I've been talking about doing something while uh, our process goes to, uh, I mean, our, our process is blocked by I/O or not, cannot proceed with doing I/O. So uh, uh, ideally, what you would want to have is whatever program you have, either you have a web server or some simple script which is, you know, doing I/O. Uh, and is also you know supposed to do some of the other independent task while it is doing i/O you want to be able to proceed uh, and do the other task so here what i'm doing is uh, all this while we have been uh, we have been just sending data some random bytes uh, we are still going to do that but when our program cannot uh, when our client cannot send more bytes it is just going to increment a random counter and that's it uh, and what we are going to see is both of these independent tasks, absolutely independent tasks, can proceed together. The overall system can proceed together. Uh, and we'll just quickly <coughs> run this here. So here we, I have like two functions. My first function here is uh, basically a, you know, a very large, I should rather make it larger. Okay, this should be good. Uh, uh, just you know, a counter that you know keeps on incrementing uh, the variable i, and the other task is other function is basically uh, it sends the data that we expect uh, we want to send to it uh, to a particular server. Now, how we make this happen? How we uh, organize our code here so that both of these functions basically uh, proceed together uh, or uh, what you say concurrently. Uh, we make use of generators to you know, switch execution. Uh, so generators are basically special kinds of functions which have the yield uh, keyword in them. Uh, what generators let you do is they allow you to suspend execution, uh, also allow you to return something, suspend execution, execution of them, and then later on return, you know, resume that execution. So here in our main block, uh, main if block, we just uh, call this other task as our main task where we are incrementing the counters, uh, and then I've created two. I've called send data task twice. Uh, what I'm going to, just to make it like a little more complex, I'm going to be sending data to two different servers, where I'll have two different servers in, uh, server instances running here. So let's, that, let's do that quickly. 
one server is listening on port one, two, three, four. The other one, I'll make it listen on five, six, seven, eight. So I have like the same two servers doing the absolutely the same thing, just listening on two different ports. Uh, and our main client script is going to uh, send uh, foo and bar to both these servers uh, at the same, <coughs> not at the same time, but concurrently. Uh, when it cannot send data to one, it will try to send it to another. Uh, and let's just quickly run this. So, so both our servers are receiving some data. One is receiving whatever it was supposed to. The other one is receiving the other thing. And our counter was also incrementing around around the same time. Uh, this will keep on going, so I'll just stop this. Uh, and how do we make this happen using select and non-blocking? So let's just quickly look at that. So here we maintain a, a list of tasks which we basically want to execute, and then we create uh, we we execute these tasks one by one. So uh, here we have uh, right. So uh, tasks is basically our list of uh, tasks that are pending for execution or that have not returned completely. So when we start off, none of these functions have returned. Uh, and then we execute a long while loop, which basically keeps on execute, which keeps on running until we have some pending tasks left or some file descriptors that we wanted to you know, monitor. So the, 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 it's sort of an ugly design, but it's just good enough for understanding this, is uh, we run every task one by one. And how you run a generator is basically you, that when you call this function, it returns a generator. And then you pass that to a next function, which assumes execution for that generation, generator. So uh, we execute every task one by one in this for loop. And uh, resume execution here. If the generator returns anything, uh, we catch that. So in case of our send data task, uh, we yield here, where we say that this is the socket that we want to monitor. And W is basically, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's a flag sort of a thing for saying that we want to monitor the socket for right events. Uh, no, so the way I had written this was that, let's say if uh, there was another function which returned a socket and wanted to be monitored for exceptions or reads, we could have done that. And our other task function basically just yields, because this does not need really monitoring of any other you know, file descriptor. So we, it, this just yields. And later in our main block. Uh, yes, so here we capture the whatever response was yielded back to us. Uh, and uh, we check if any socket was returned there. And you know, uh, put the, uh, uh, and create, uh, create uh, keep a map of, or uh, create a relation between uh, what was that uh, you know, socket object and what is the associated task. So since we return a tuple there uh, of uh, what kind of an event was that, that was the write event or the read event, and uh, what is the object that we are monitoring, that we maintain here in this, uh, in this dictionary, where uh, every you know, socket that is being monitored for writing or reading is uh, kept. And then associated task. So uh, we run the task, and yeah, so we keep running that task uh, and move further. And then we see if we had, after running all these tasks one by one, if we had any task uh, that actually returned and asked us to monitor for uh, any file descriptor. So uh, here we check list of, if, we, if the list of, um, uh, if the dictionaries for monitoring write events or read events were, uh, are empty or not, if they had any objects, if they have any objects, we just call select on those objects. So here, we call select.select, .select, uh, and uh, 
ask select to monitor all the uh, socket objects that we asked for reading uh, ask select to monitor all socket objects for writing and well we don't have any support for exceptions yet so we just pass an empty array and set timeout to zero and select basically returns all the so sockets that are available for reading or writing and then we go back to our file descriptors uh, relation see all those sockets that are of that basically are uh, are in the list of readable sockets uh, we pick up their task and append them back in the new tasks list which is going to be executed in the net next iteration same thing is done for writable sockets and then basically assign tasks a new task to task so that when the next while loop iteration happens that list of tasks gets gets picked, picked up, uh, gets picked up so uh, here what when, when we run our program for the first time what happens is the normal other task gets executed which is the counter task uh, then we send data to one of the servers and then we send data to, to the second server immediately uh, because both are non blocking they re return immediately uh, and both of uh, both of those calls actually ask us to monitor file descriptors for writing which we monitor here in the select call the select call returns immediately because it is it has a timeout set to 0 and that we do because we have another task in hand at least which we can perform while these sockets are not available for reading so uh, so if select returns us any list of readable or writable sockets we just you know add uh, that in the task list for the ne next iteration otherwise that uh, that task list only has uh, other task as the as the task that is going to be executed in the next iteration so every time we run a while loop on every while loop iteration we are not trying to send data we are trying to send data only when the socket is actually available for sending data uh, and otherwise all the other time we are basically uh, we're doing all the other tasks that are not dependent on that and very cooperatively just two minutes okay uh, and uh, with the help of generators and select we were able to actually you know cooperatively schedule um, our tasks and i've been told that i have only 2 minutes to go so i'm going to uh, sort of rush through this probably we can catch up outside um uh, so yeah quickly uh, uh this yeah so the good thing here is that this does not block sends all the data not just to one server but actually multiple servers uh it's not consuming cpu and just you know keep on trying to uh send data and failing select helps us with that and uh, we also while running all these loops uh we have uh, some room to basically you know do other tasks well while our uh, you know socket objects or any other file descriptor is not ready for reading writing uh so uh just a second yeah so uh, that was actually 1.4 i think i missed one of the examples in between but yeah what i want here what this slide actually talks about this is the example that we actually saw last uh yeah the, the large while loop that you see that is like that that's your network event loop uh, if if event loops is something that you have heard about yeah, in general they are like that not as ugly obviously because uh, this was written actually for the sake of understanding uh but yeah event loops are sort of like that where you are actually monitoring for event so uh, just like select uh, there are there's some other infrastructure that is provided to you by the operating system uh, for monitoring uh, file descriptors uh, one of, some of them in fact all of them here are listed pole uh, was the one that sort of like came immediately after select and addresses some problems with select select as select as limited uh, by the number of file descriptors it can actually monitor uh, uh, pretty much standard today is epol and kq uh epol is uh, limited to linux and kq to bsd uh, uh epol addresses some problems with pole and select basically it does not iterate on all the events uh, on all the file descriptors that you have asked to monitor uh, uh very quickly just two three slides uh, um, that i'm left with so i'll i'll just like skim through them uh the problem with all these infrastructures is that all right may some operators uh, some operating systems may not support other methods so uh you might want to you know uh, write some software that runs across 
operating systems, let's say on uh, a Mac OS and a Linux and also on Windows. So there are libraries to solve such problems. There's uh, libevent, there's libev, uh, there's libuv, which is actually noded, uh, used in the node runtime. Um, uh, maybe there are more, but these are the ones that I'm at least aware of. Uh, in the Python world, at least, oh, sorry, huh, yes. Uh, there, there are a couple of libraries. Uh, gevent is the one uh, which is actually a C extension. Uh, probably the easiest to start with. Does not really have to. You don't really have to. You know, uh, change a lot about the way you write your programs. Uh, same is similar is the case with eventlet, uh, but that's a pure Python implementation, and you might want to um, test out what you want to use. Uh, there are a couple of frameworks like Twisted and Tornado. Mind you, these are frameworks, not really. Uh, uh, libraries, so they have you know some uh, 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 some conventions, uh, some ideas attached to them, and you might want to adapt, you know accept those. Um, Async IO has come up; uh, it feels more like a framework, but it is in the standard library. So uh, I don't know like where to exactly put that. Uh, and questions? Yes, just like one small note. Uh, why do we really worry about these things or want to know about these things? Well, mostly you wouldn't, uh, other than really understanding how these things work, uh, unless you realize that you actually need to write a library for achieving something like this by yourself, because all the other existing uh, you know, frameworks and libraries uh, and tools at your hand do not really solve your problem. Uh, the day that happens, well, you'll probably want to delve deeper into the subject, uh, but uh, at least as of now, you can stay, sort of like stay happy with just knowing how these work, uh, but like stick to the libraries um, that are already available out there uh, because they actually are pretty foolproof. Right, so we're running short on time. Uh, before we go on to questions, uh, in the next two minutes, in fact, uh, the next talk over on the other side will be improving and testing with PyTest and Mock, and the next talk here will be concurrent computations on logical processors. Uh, do we have any questions for questions? If you want more time, we can actually catch up outside as well. Yes. So that the other speaker uh, can prepare. Quite a bit of time after the keynote for you to look for a talk.